Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm here with Mr. Samuel Andreev for the third time. We've already had two conversations, the first one basically about uh, music across times and cultures, how it evolved and perhaps comparing it across different cultures, and the second one about uh, how we can evaluate pieces of music and even art in general. And so uh, after our last conversation, we decided that perhaps it could be good to have a third one just because after the interview was over, we discussed a little bit some topics related to uh, people's aesthetic preferences and artistic preferences and where they come from and if they are innate or acquired. So basically, we're here today to talk about that. So, Mr. Andreev, thank you a lot for taking the time to come again on the show. Thank you. It's a, it's a real pleasure. I'm, I'm happy to get a chance to talk to you again. Okay, so okay, so uh, perhaps I would start by asking you what do you think about that? What, what is your view on uh, perhaps how people acquire their artistic or aesthetic tastes? Do you think that there's a part of it that perhaps are is innate and another part that is acquired? I, I mean, from your personal experience and since you're an artist, what do you think about that? Well, I yes, a lot of it certainly is acquired. Um, a lot of it comes from language. Um, and I think that the, the particular language that you grow up with is something that conditions a lot about, about you as a person. Um, and I would actually argue that the, the question of language is probably even more important than the, the question of, of nationality of, of, of a specific country. So, for example, I think you could argue that there is a, a sort of Anglophone um, identity and that that sort of conditions the way you think. I think I think speaking a particular language as opposed to a different one conditions the way the way that people think. I, I've certainly had that experience myself because I'm bilingual. I also speak French, and I've often had the very strange uh, experience of speaking in one or the other language and and feeling as though I'm a different person depending on which language I'm speaking. It's it's very very odd. So anyway, so certainly the the language the culture that you grew up in. Um, those are those are acquired things, and I think that they certainly condition people very strongly in terms of what they're likely to be interested in, and and what is, well, even more important than what they're likely to be interested in is what is familiar to them. It's like it's it's two different things. So, for example, um, you, you know, for a lot of people, they're interested in things by default, not because they've actually taken the chance to think about them. And to consider a lot of different options, and to you know engage with a wide variety of different types of art and culture, but they they're sort of interested by default in the things that are the most familiar to them, simply because you don't have to think about it; it takes the least effort. So if if there's something that is so completely present in your culture that you know it requires no effort on your part whatsoever to understand it or to appreciate it, then those are going to be the sorts of things that consciously or unconsciously are are you know have have the biggest presence in your life culturally um the the number of people i think that will consciously set out to sort of cultivate themselves and investigate other areas of aesthetic interest i think are probably in the minority because it, it takes it takes a certain amount of effort and time in order to do that and not a lot of people have a lot of spare time that they can invest in something like that so that's also a consideration Mm -hmm. Yes, that's interesting because, uh, I mean, so w would you say that uh, from an innate perspective, perhaps uh, the only things that really matter here is that we are able to hear sounds that come from a certain rage that is, for example, there are other animals like dogs that can hear uh, sounds that uh, we're not really aware of them, let's say. And in terms of perhaps visual aesthetics, we can see colors from a certain range and things like that. So uh, th that is perhaps important for us to understand uh, what people can 
capture perceptually and then uh, perceive as art or evaluate as such, not only as art, but any other thing. But I, I mean, if people cannot perceive in some way something, a music or a painting or something like that, I mean, they wouldn't really even be able to like it because they wouldn't know it exists even. But uh, apart from those uh, scientific slash technical details, do you think that really w from uh, all the things that we have around us, what we tend to classify as art and uh, appreciate, appreciate as such is something that we acquire over our lifetime by being exposed to certain pieces of art and the art that is prevalent in the culture that we're part of. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's a, a big part of it. I mean, you, you talked about um, sort of physiological mm -hmm. uh, determinants as well. So, for example, uh, being able to hear in a specific frequency range or the sorts of colors that you're going to be most most attuned to and that sort of thing. But I think actually the, the question is really a lot simpler for most people. It's just um, if, if you're confronted with a work of art and you're unable to extract any meaning from it, you know, it doesn't have any immediate meaning to you, or else, um, what would be another way to put it? If you don't have any criteria for evaluating it, then I think that is very disturbing for audiences. It, it can be. So, so for example, ima imagine you go to a concert and you're hearing a piece of music that is so completely foreign to you. You've never heard anything like it. Then what are your criteria going to be you know, in, for determining whether or not it's a good piece of music? You might not even know if you've enjoyed it or not. You know, it, it, it can be a very disorienting experience. So I think going into something where you have no criteria for determining whether or not it's it's good on its own terms. I think that can be difficult. And then secondly, if you engage with the art, whether it's a, a painting or a book or whatever, and you're unable to extract meaning from it effortlessly, you know, it, it would take it would take some effort on your part on your part to determine what it is that the artist is trying to communicate, then you might find that discouraging. Whereas, you know, the, the definition of popular culture is that that sort of step is just removed. It, it doesn't come into it because you're dealing with things that are, you know, in essence, they're they're completely they're completely familiar. So, you know, if if I hear a new pop song on the radio, it's not going to be new in the sense that <clears throat> something really completely new is going to be new. It's going to be slightly new. It's going to be one percent new. It's, it's going to be a variation on things that I've already heard hundreds of times before. But that slight one percent of variation in it will be enough to make me hear it as you know something that's new enough so that I'm interested in listening to it, but not so new that I'm completely disoriented when I do hear it. So one factor that I think is very important is the degree of novelty that exists in a work of art. So there, you know, so a lot of a lot of popular culture, a lot of commercial music, um, television shows, and so on play on the, the idea that they have a very, very low amount of novelty. So in other words, you're not going to be overly surprised. You might be a bit surprised, but you're not going to be completely off in another world when you engage with it. And then on the other side, you have art that has an extremely high quotient of novelty, right? So you you engage with it, and there's there are there's level upon level of things that you've never encountered before and that you don't necessarily know how to understand or how to interpret. And that's where it becomes tricky, I think, for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, talking now specifically about music, uh, do you in music think about or know something about if uh, people perhaps tend to prefer sounds in terms of their frequency that could resemble natural sounds in the sense that perhaps sounds that would be similar to human voices or perhaps animal vocalizations or even other sorts of natural sounds like rain and and storms and thunder and things like that. I, I mean, are there any work done that you know 
uh, that perhaps compares uh, the, the characteristics of natural sounds to the, the sounds that we usually hear in, music, in musical pieces. Well, that, that's a permanent feature of music history because any, any uh, repertoire that you care to mention is going to be using sound metaphorically. In other words, it's using sound not just as an abstract collection of, of pitches and rhythms and so on, but it's using them to point to things that are familiar from the way we interact with the world. So, for example, if you look at classical music, I mean, music written between, let's say, approximately 1750 and, and let's say, 1830, something like that. So that would be, you know, Beethoven, Mozart, Haydn, um, uh, Schubert, that sort of repertoire. So those composers were, uh, were using rhythms that are based on dances, so popular dances of, of the time. So they had a relatively restricted range, actually, of rhythmic figures that they would use, and they, they had a specific connotation. If you use this rhythm, it was referring to this particular type of dance, and it might be a fast dance, it might be a slow dance, but it's, it's all ultimately a metaphor for actual physical movement in space where you're actually moving. So it's, it's metaphorical in that sense, because you know, if, you, if, you, if you're listening to a piano sonata, or to a fugue or something like this, you know, the odds are very low that you're actually going to get up and start dancing. I mean, it's it's highly it's a highly stylized form of dance. It's not it's not actual dance. Like you're probably not going to actually dance to it. But the point is it 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 borrows from the 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 rhythmic figures that are associated with those dances and then uses them in a very stylized way uh, in in a composition. So that's one thing. Um, also, I mean, it, you, it's it's kind of interesting in the in the sort of late seventeenth century, there was a bit of a fad for imitativa, where you would have um, instrumentalists attempting to imitate sounds of particular animals. Uh, there was uh, the, the Italian composer Corelli wrote um, a very famous example of that, where the violinist has to sort of s scrape their their bow against the instrument in such a way as to imitate a, a dog or whatever. It's actually it's a very peculiar piece. So I mean that that was actually a, a sort of micro genre of uh, uh, of, uh, of investigation in the in the Baroque period, but more generally, you know, when you when you start getting into things like modernism, this idea of uh, basing rhythms on things like you know a military march or the sound of a, a horse galloping or a, a courtly dance of some kind. You know, when you get into the 20th century, composers no longer want to base their music on things like that because they're no longer part of the sounds of the 20th century. Uh, the composer, the American composer, Elliot Carter, uh, had a very interesting thing to say about that. He said, we're no longer going around on horses. We're traveling in airplanes. And our experience of, of speed and of movement today is completely different than what it was in the 19th century. So we need to invent a different rhythmic vocabulary that is in keeping with what the 20th century actually feels like. So he started experimenting with rhythms that had to do with a sort of a constant acceleration and deceleration. They're completely elastic all the time. You never get exactly the same rhythm twice, this sort of thing. Um, and that was for reasons having to do with the characteristics of his immediate environment. So composers have always, I think, reacted to the sorts of sounds that surround us and the sorts of ways that we metaphorically uh, encode those sounds and, and turn them into a piece of music. That's that's always been a, a, a central feature of, uh, of Western composition. Mm -hmm. Okay, and since you refer to the association between music and musical sounds and perhaps <coughs> me metaphor and also bodily movements or something like that, it's interesting because uh, I mean, I've been talking with a lot of psychologists and particularly evolutionary psychologists on my show, and uh, I haven't yet talked about uh, specifically about this with anyone, but there's a thing in evolutionary psychology that people call the Savannah hypothesis that in this case it does not refer specifically to music, but rather to uh, paintings or uh, scenery and and also the way um, what we consider beautiful in human beings, men and women. And it says something like, uh, in terms of scenery, we would tend to prefer 
uh, paintings that showed uh, physical spaces that resembled as much as possible the colors that we were exposed to in the savannah that was the space where we basically evolved and uh, the type of space that is open space with very few trees and uh, ample space for us to be able to detect uh, prey and predators and things like that. And, uh, and, and I would like to ask you if uh, you think that there could be something equivalent to that in music, that is something that perhaps we were exposed to and that has a biological basis when it comes to us preferring certain sounds or, uh, instead of others, perhaps. Yeah, I mean, I think the idea of a, of a, a regular pulse of some kind is probably fairly primordial. And I'm obviously not an expert on on these sorts of things, as far as the sort of physiological aspect goes, but it's hard not to imagine that the sort of mother's heartbeat is is something that uh, that conditions us to sort of have a preference for periodic rhythms um, as opposed to chaotic rhythms. I mean, if if you're producing completely chaotic rhythms with your heart, then there's probably something wrong, you know. So, but there's a few ways to look at that. So, so uh, you could say, well, we're going to um, we're going to emphasize the, the periodic rhythm because there's something soothing about it. And that's actually true. But maybe the function of art is not always to soothe people necessarily. Um, you know, the, the German composer Karlheinz Stockhausen actually had an interesting thing to say about that also, because he was, he was writing a long series of piano pieces starting in the 1950s. Uh, and the, the early pieces in this series uh, had very, very complex rhythms, completely unpredictable rhythms. Um, in which you would have one part that was, you know, uh, very slightly faster than another part, and then it would slow down a little bit, and then just really, really complex things. And so in order to play these pieces, you have to think in, in one speed with your left hand and then two different speeds with your right hand, and it's it's quite complicated. But his, his description of how he arrived at that was actually quite interesting. He, he pointed out, yes, our, our bodies have all of these different periodic rhythms that they produce, you know, the, the speed at which you blink, uh, the speed at which you walk, the the, the rate of your heartbeat, etc. Uh, but all of these rhythms are different from each other, and they're happening at the same time. So if you were actually to chart all of these different rhythms that are going on at the same time, you would end up with this incredibly complicated polyrhythm. So that was his way of um, of of dealing with that question was to say, well, our our, our our experience is actually quite a lot more complex than just a single periodic rhythm. There's an awful lot going on that a lot of the time is filtered out of our perception, but nevertheless, it, it's still happening physiologically. And so the idea of uh, sort of, I, th I, think, I think he had faith in the idea that human beings would evolve to a point where they could, um, they could be consciously aware of all of these different rhythms that are all slightly different from each other and sort of enjoy the, the, the differing um, rhythmic speeds that are going on all at the same time and the different interference patterns that this creates. So, I mean, but that, that's also part of modernism is the idea that, you know, it's just, it's exciting to innovate. It's exciting to try new things. It's exciting to try to expand the range of what your perceptions can, can encompass. Mm -hmm. Okay. And in our previous interviews, we talked a lot about the differences between the music that is appreciated by the elites and the music that is appreciated by the rest of people, basically, and also how that changed throughout history. Uh, so uh, I would like to ask you now, what do you think about the importance of the social component when it comes to acquiring our aesthetic and artistic tastes? Because, I, I mean, per perhaps there, there's also something to that, right? I, I mean, if, if perhaps I'm part of the elite of or of an artistic elite perhaps uh, the i tend to prefer or to like the same things that people who are also part of that social group also tend to like and perhaps that they also developed in some way to prefer uh, in order to distinguish themselves also from the rest of people and 
uh, when it comes perhaps to pop popular music and popular art, we have uh, the same effect, but uh, basically because lots and lots of people prefer, for example, a particular piece of music, then it gets popularized and people are led to also uh, to also like that music due to its social component, let's say, something like that. Yeah, that's probably true to some degree, but I mean, th there are there are characteristics, though, of things that, that are extremely popular. I mean, one of them is that they're memorable. In other words, you can, you know, a song that's really popular is, is usually not a song that's extremely difficult to remember. It's usually got something catchy about it. You hear it once and you kind of remember it, and then it gets stuck in your mind. So I think having a very low barrier to immediate um, appreciation and recognition of the of the art is something that definitely helps. If, if the barrier is set too high, in other words, if you have to hear it five or six times before you can make anything out of it, then it's unlikely to to have any kind of you know massive um, popular impact in that sense. Um, so so I, I don't know if that's exactly a question of simplicity because there's lots of popular art that's actually rather sophisticated. It's 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 very well made. And, and sometimes there are some very surprising things in popular songs. But nevertheless, there has to be, I think, a level of immediate seduction. In other words, you hear the thing for the first time, there's something about it that's immediately striking and, and memorable. And that's not a criteria that you often see applied to art music. But I think that actually, when you start to think about that way, it becomes very interesting. So for example, I, I do a lot of juries and a lot of competitions and things like that, and where I have to look at a lot of music very quickly. And one of the things that I always look for is, you know, is, is there something about this piece that if I were to hear it once and then not think about it for five years and then sort of try to remember it five years later, would there be anything about it, any any feature whatsoever that would stick out in my mind? It's it's a kind of interesting mental exercise you can do. You can do it with with any type of art, actually, with paintings, with uh, and and so if if the art leaves absolutely no trace on your memory, it's just it's kind of featureless, you know, there's nothing about it that's particularly memorable or striking, you just forget about it and you go on to the next one, then that might be a sign that there's not enough depth or that the artist hasn't tried hard enough or that the ideas are not particularly striking, etc. So that's that's part of it. Whereas I think that uh, in popular culture, if you can make something that immediately grabs pe people's attention within 10 seconds or less, then it's going to probably have an impact. Um, and that impact can grow exponentially in ways that are often very surprising. Like, I mean, one of the one of the most popular videos in YouTube history is the song Gangnam Style. I don't think it's still the number one video, but it was it's been viewed I think two billion times or something. And it's like, how do you how do you explain a phenomenon like that? It's it's complicated. It isn't as though you can just say, well, objectively, it's the greatest piece of music on YouTube, because I don't I don't think you could really seriously make that claim. Uh, but Nevertheless, there seems to be something about it anyway that is memorable or striking or unusual. And then it creates a, a, a strange kind of snowball effect where um, then it becomes a, a, a sort of meta object because people are not just watching it to watch the song. They're watching it to see how popular the song can be. It's, it's a very, very strange thing. And then it takes on these completely ridiculous proportions. Mm hmm. Yes, exactly. And isn't it problematic when we try to look back in history and see and try to find patterns in terms of uh, the music that, in this case, music, of course, that people liked? Because, I mean, probably most of the pieces that survived time uh, before at least the Industrial Revolution, uh, Revolution yes, uh, perhaps uh, most of them were the ones that uh, only the elites were exposed to them because I mean people didn't re most people didn't really have access to uh, that type of music they only had access to popular music that perhaps uh, I mean perhaps it was much more difficult for it to get to uh, to survive over time and to get to us nowadays because uh, 
because the elites were investing in certain particular pieces of art and in this case musical pieces and I mean, what I'm trying to say here is that perhaps when we look back and say, oh, uh, people used to listen to this type of music, so people that lived here or there really like this type of music. I mean, aren't we, if we say that, aren't we perhaps limiting our view to what it, what the elites were exposed to and not really people in general? Well, it's a bit of a complicated question because it, it, the, the factors that determine what, pe what works of art are retained in the repertoire and, and sort of have some kind of persistence across time. Right. Uh, it, it's not simply a question of people liking it uh, sort of in a... In a, in a a mass consumer sort of sense. It, it's not. It's not that simple. So, actually, I mean, one of the biggest factors that has tended to determine whether works of art remain in the concert repertoire has been the appreciation of other composers. I mean, it's, it's largely been composers who have determined what the pieces are that are retained. I can give you a few concrete examples of that. So, uh, today, I mean, everybody takes it for granted that Bach is one of the one of the the the, the absolutely most primordial composers in in uh, the western classical music canon he's he's probably you know many people's number one composer in terms of his his the depth of his innovation his 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 brilliance the the profundity of his ideas and so on uh, but that was by no means an obvious thing for a very long time in fact it wasn't really until felix mendelssohn started to um started to uh perform the the sort of large-scale works of Bach, the, the Passions and orat Oratorios and things like this, which nobody was really bothering with. I mean, there was a huge mass of music by Bach, all the, all the cantatas and the Passions and so on, that nobody was playing. I mean, these pieces hadn't been performed at all since their, since their premieres. So it, it took efforts on, on the behalf of other musicians, other composers, to say, wait a minute, there's something of, of value in these pieces and we should be listening to them. Uh, but in the case of Bach, that took over a hundred years for that to happen. In the case of a great deal of his repertoire, so and and that's happened with many composers throughout history. It's the same with Vivaldi. Vivaldi's music was completely forgotten about for about two hundred years, and then it was rediscovered and again by musicians. So it's it isn't as though there's some kind of a a popularity contest that's going on where the works that achieve some kind of immediate popular success are automatically retained. It's not that simple. Like there, are, there are many examples of very popular operas that are completely forgotten today. You know, operas that that were far more successful in their time than than uh, major works by you, you know you can name the composer by Haydn or Mozart or whoever. So, it's it's a little bit more complicated than that. So the so having the the what would you call it? Um, having the 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 uh, the work appreciated by an important and influential artist. At some point in the future, uh, who can encourage other people to engage with it and spend time with it, I think is also an important factor. And that has nothing to do with popular success. It has to do with uh, someone whose aesthetic judgment is held in high esteem, uh, being being able to say, okay, this is something worth paying attention to, and then using whatever resources they have to uh, to encourage its dissemination. I think that's a very important factor. And that's something that is not always easy to predict, because again, you can have Composers who are completely forgotten for 200 years, the, the 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 fortunes of a particular work of of art can be extremely variable across time, and the the things that we appreciate now, you can't necessarily guarantee that they will still be appreciated in 200 years. Mm -hmm. Yes, but perhaps when it comes to uh, okay, let's say that for example, someone wanted to study. Uh, pieces of music from different times to try to find patterns in terms of uh, what are the common characteristics uh, across all times that, uh, and try to understand what people really like about music and what is common even in different cultures and so on. Don't, don't you think that perhaps if people were to collect pieces of music that uh, that really got preserved until to until our times that uh, 
uh, perhaps the, uh, that wouldn't be the best approach to really know what people back then liked in terms of music. No, it wouldn't tell you much because there are all kinds of uh, pieces, again, that, that were very popular at one point and that are completely forgotten now. I mean, a lot of the sort of uh, Tin Pan Alley, I, I, like sort of the, the popular songs that were being written in the 1920s, for example, in America, there were just thousands and thousands of songs being, being churned out all the time by professional songwriters. And some of them were very, very popular in their day, and they're completely forgotten now. I mean, nobody remembers them anymore. So the, it's, 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 not, it's not that simple. Um, so and and again, like the the fortunes of a of a particular work of art will tend to change. So maybe at some point, fifty years in the future, uh, those songs will be rediscovered and and uh, and reevaluated, and they'll be found to be very significant. But I, I mean, I think one factor that certainly is is important is the you know if if a work of art stays in some kind of a repertoire for hundreds of years, in other words, it's still being performed, it's still being talked about, it's still being listened to, it's still being thought about, then that shows that there's something resilient about it. In other words, it, it can hold up under that level of scrutiny. Um, and that really says something. That means that there is depth, there's complexity, there's richness. That means that it's, it's well made. That means that it has something of profound value to say also. And that's probably a reasonably good indication that those qualities are there if people are still bothering with it hundreds of years later. Um, you, there are there are examples of artists uh, in, in art history who have had that that kind of they've sort of exerted this this intense fascination for centuries. I mean, Da Vinci is a very good example of that. There there have been maybe a couple of brief periods since he was alive where maybe his work wasn't particularly uh, thought of all that much. But I mean, by and large, since his death, it's been completely legendary and it's only grown across time. And the, the, the artworks that he produced have, have achieved this quasi-religious significance for many, many people. And I think that that shows that there is an extraordinary depth in those works of art. And there's something there that can't be easily exhausted. And that's a very fascinating idea, I think. That the idea that a, a work of art could be so rich and could have so many uh, connections within it and, and have such a complexity of meaning that it literally cannot be exhausted that there's always something new to be discovered in it. There's always something, some new angle that you can you can consider it under, and that's a completely independent thing from the success that this or that artwork has in during the lifetime of its creator. Mm -hmm. and, and when we're talking about here about works of art that really are appreciated over long stretch, stretches of time, uh, th does it matter if they are only appreciated by people who really are professional artists or are trained to really evaluate pieces of art according to certain established criteria, or that they also they are also appreciated by uh, non-professional, non-specialized people. Well, they'll they'll tend to be appreciated most by the people that are going to be willing to put a bit of time into thinking about them and, and engaging with them. I mean, that's that's just how it goes. I mean, the more you spend, the more time you spend with something, and the more effort you put into appreciating it, appreciating it, the more you'll get out of it. But that's true of anything in life. So um, I suppose that people that uh, that only know the work very superficially will have a very superficial appreciation of it. That doesn't mean they won't enjoy it. That doesn't mean they won't be able to get something out of it. But but the person who spends their entire lifetime uh, reflecting very deeply on, on those questions or on that work of art or whatever it may be will presumably have some, some more insights or at least they'll, they'll have thought about it more deeply and maybe they'll have extracted out more value from that work of art you know, by virtue of just having thought about it more deeply. Um, you can't necessarily expect everybody in the world to be deeply interested in art because the fact is there are there are lots of things about life that that make lives fulfilling and interesting and art is certainly one of them for me it's a it's it's an incredibly important part but you have to recognize that there are other things in life that are also important too i mean there might be the person who whose greatest pleasure is going out in the outdoors and and going mountain climbing or whatever or you know or 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 going sailing, these sorts of things, or I don't know, anything, or spending time with their families. 
So there's, there's all sorts of things in life that are fulfilling. Uh, art is one component of that. I happen to think that it, it's extremely important and valuable and that I think it would be wonderful if everybody could have an opportunity to engage with it. But you also have to recognize that it's not going to be the case for everybody. Uh, not everyone is innately interested in in the sort of aesthetic world and is going to you know, put a lot of effort into appreciating it. Mm -hmm. Yes, and another issue here when we're trying to uh, compare music uh, or different pieces of music from different times, particularly different times, is, isn't it also an issue that perhaps um, before or uh, a lot of time ago, people... Uh, I, I mean, is, it isn't easy to say that people wouldn't really like certain pieces of music that we have nowadays because they weren't re really able also to produce them back then because they also didn't have the necessary technology to do it. And I mean, if we look back to, for example, the Middle Ages or even... Uh, I don't know, even to tribes of hunter-gatherers or something like that. Uh, I mean, perhaps if they were exposed to pieces of music that we have nowadays and that are popular or really very liked by people, perhaps they would also appreciate them. But we, uh, we can't really look back and... Uh, find those same patterns from from those times because they were also somewhat limited by the technology they had back then, right? And and perhaps other aspects as well. Well, I see points of similarity between a just and let's say a piece of music, a piece of medieval music, because we understand the trajectory of Western music and we can trace things back to their roots and we can see how this evolved from that and where this came from and, and so on because we we understand all of the intervening history but if you were to play a piece of music from today to somebody living in the 14th century then I think the, the likeliest outcome is that they would be completely shocked and would be unable to even understand it as being music in the first place because there would be absolutely nothing about it that they would be able to understand I mean the thing is it isn't just a question of, of technology. It's also a question of the entire uh, social structure that we're embedded in, and that, that that is reflected in the art that we produce. So our, our values today are different. Our technology is different. Our language is different. The way we think is different. Um, all of these things are they're, 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 they're reflected in the art. So it isn't simply a, a purely technological question of, of using chords that didn't exist 600 years years ago or using an instrument that didn't exist. There's also the whole question of, of the meaning of the art, of the culture within which it was created, the, the, the role that it has within that culture, the status it has within that culture, um, the things that it means to people who listen to it today, uh, and the sort of the sort of the entire network of, of value structures within which that, that work exists. And n absolutely none of that would have been the same 600 years ago. So you'd be you know, I, I think it would it would be as as strange as if an iPhone were to suddenly appear in you know in a in a farm in the Netherlands in in the 15th century. Mm -hmm. Okay, so perhaps when earlier in the interview I was trying to talk about the social component of music, then perhaps. Uh, there's another aspect to it that is the fact that in a certain culture people also have to be able to identify certain certain patterns of sound, let's say, as music, even for them to be able to evaluate it as such? Well, there again, though, it, it depends on... on you're familiar with and, and what sort of cultural context you're in. So if you if you go to hear a concert of contemporary music, um, you know, and, and expect it to sound like, um, I don't know, like like a like a new a new pop song, then you're going to be very disoriented and confused. But I mean, I I, I wouldn't imagine that too many people would go to you know an, an orchestral concert of new pieces and expect them to sound like to sound like uh, you know a hit song. So 
um, it, it's it's partly a question of what your expectations are. So if if you turn on the radio to a top forty radio station, then you're you're going to expect to hear popular music. And if you turn it on, and then you know that's what you're expecting, and then you hear something uh, completely avant garde, then obviously you're going to be uh, disappointed, maybe, and and surprised, and you're going to have a hard time understanding what you're hearing simply because it's completely alien to that context. But you know if if you're in in New York in the 1960s and you're interested in avant-garde art and you're going to art galleries and you're listening to all sorts of concerts of avant-garde music, then you're not going to be shocked when you hear something unusual or something innovative because that's what you're expecting within that particular cultural context. So I, I don't think that there's really too much of a problem because most of the time people listen to things where they have some idea of what they're going to get, what the level of innovation is going to be. And it, it's it's coherent with the the sort of um, what would you say the, the listening situation that they're in. So you know if there's a new Justin Bieber album, you know you would be very shocked and surprised if he suddenly started making avant-garde electronic music because that's not what you associate him with. And if you were listening to you know the latest composition by I don't know any any random contemporary composer and and it it, it sounded like a bunch of um, <laughs> like a bunch of sort of very typical pop music, then you would also find that very strange and surprising. So, you know, context is a, is a big part of it. So it, it isn't as though, you know, this sort of average person on the street wanders into a concert of, of contemporary music and is completely shocked. Like that just doesn't, doesn't really happen. Like if you go to a concert of contemporary music, you know, most of the time, not nine times out of 10, that, you know, you have some idea of the fact that this is going to be something new, it's going to be maybe something that you've, you've not heard before, and you go into it with that expectation. Mm -hmm. Okay, so in our last interview, toward the end of it, we talked about modernism and postmodernism, and perhaps the ways people think about those two major artistic movements, let's say. But I, I would like to ask you now, because when people refer to the effects that first modernism and uh, then postmodernism had on art and specifically in this case in music, they tend to say that uh, artists from those movements uh, tended to uh, t tended to explore uh, ugliness, let's say, and and to try to expose people to things that were usually considered as ugly. And so, in that sense, uh, w w wouldn't they be saying that perhaps uh, through modernism and postmodernism, people uh, people who were exposed to those sorts of art uh, acquired a taste. For, for the ugly, and, and I mean, in, the, in that sense, if people were to really have acquired the taste for something that was ugly, and they started appreciating it as art or as something aesthetic, uh, I mean, would it make sense to still call it ugly, or should, should we call it beautiful? I, I mean... There's some there's somewhat of a complicated issue here because uh, if people say that um, so something that is and they usually say it they usually say that it was objectively ugly and even sometimes artists uh, intentionally uh, use that to shock people but I mean after that if we go through a pro a process of acquiring those sorts of artistic tastes? I, I mean, uh, how should we deal with, with that kind of stuff? Well, I can't really answer that question because it's the, the problem is it's too general because you, you have to, you have to spe speak about specific works at a certain point. Mm -hmm. And when you, when, you, when you use terms like modernism, I mean, mo modernism is not a very well-defined term for one thing. So it, it actually, in, in terms of in terms of music, in terms of music that was written under the term of, of modernism, or at least that has some connection to historical modernism, uh, it, it encompasses all sorts of things that are extremely diverse and extremely different from each other. And it, it isn't as though you can just say, oh, that's a piece of modernist music and, and understand what it sounds like. So it, probably there there were some artists and composers who were interested in in things that had a certain shock value to them, or that that uh, were were unsettling, 
or disturbing or strange to observe. And there's a certain aesthetic power that, that goes with that. But I mean, think about the number of people that um, that like to watch horror movies, for example, or that like to watch uh, really scary movies generally. I mean, it's it's a very similar thing. You're you're engaging with something that is deliberately making you uncomfortable, and you're and you're doing it on purpose. You're you're deliberately subjecting yourself to that experience. Uh, that's something that I personally don't really understand very well because I actually can't stand horror movies. They they just I I, I find them incredibly unpleasant to watch, and I I don't really see the point because they they put me in a state of nervous tension that I just I don't really enjoy. But that's me, and I know there's lots of people out there who enjoy them. So so maybe that's an, an analogous phenomenon. And there's all kinds of things like that in, in popular culture of, of, of uh, uh, you know, movies that sort of make you uncomfortable or that are very sort of painful to sit through. And then you get massive numbers of people, you know, interested in these movies, like Jaws is a good example of that. It's, a, it's an absolutely horrifying, terrifying movie, but it was hugely popular. So, and, and as far as uh, sort of modernism goes, um, you could make an argument that, uh, you know, a, a painter like Picasso, for example, was very involved in uh, ex exploring uh, things that I suppose were, were sort of shocking or not thought of as conventionally beautiful. But, you know, then you have to start thinking about what it means for something to be beautiful. You know, maybe maybe a, it could have a sort of uh, intellectual component that makes it beautiful, or maybe it could have uh, a depth to it that makes it beautiful, or a meaning that makes it beautiful. And it's not simply about the the sort of uh, pictorial qualities of what's being depicted in the painting. It's a, it's a, it's a very complex question. So, you know, the, the idea that uh, that that beauty would be a sort of impressionist painting of a of a of a young girl with the sunlight streaming through her hair while she's playing the piano, you know, in a in a in a beautiful bourgeois house out in the countryside, and this is this is a this is, you know, this is the sort of uh, archetype of what a beautiful painting would be. Um, I doesn't get you very far in terms of appreciating art, as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. Okay, so so perhaps it is more uh, it has more to do with the emotional impact that it has on people, and perhaps uh, if something has more emotional impact, being it negative or positive, and really sticks in people's memories. Uh, I mean, at the end of, of the day, does it really matter if it's what people consider to be ugly or beautiful? Yeah, I, I don't think ugly or beautiful are necessarily the most important categories. I mean, if if something is striking and if it if it impacts you in a powerful way, and if if you're completely gripped by it in in such a, a way that you 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 can't stop thinking about it, like you you can't stop, you know, if it's if it's a a TV series or if it's a movie, like you you cannot stop watching because you're just completely in the in the sort of uh, in the grips of this experience. Then at that point, it's you're not you're not watching it because it's a beautiful movie. You're watching it because there's something viscerally uh, fascinating about it to you, and I think that's the that's the quality that uh, that attracts me most in terms of art. I mean, certainly the things that I engage with the most are things where it's it's above the intellectual. It's it's or it's deeper than the intellectual. Let's put it that way. It's something that before the intellect has even kicked in, there's something about it that on a very primal, immediate, physical level you're just completely gripped by and fascinated by and you want to know more about it and you want to get closer to it. And that, I think, is the is the ultimate quality that makes people want to engage with a work of art. Um, the question of, oh, this is a pretty melody, I'm enjoying listening to it because it's beautiful. I mean, yes, okay, that's that's that can be an important thing too. But it's not the it's not all of it. So I think I think depth, uh, impact, emotional resonance certainly are are absolutely primordial. Mm -hmm. Okay, so when it comes to perhaps uh, evaluating pieces of art, or even better than that, acquiring ta the taste for a certain type of art, uh, apart from the things that we've already talked about here, uh, what would you say are perhaps some other aspects that are related to perhaps the intrinsic qualities of that piece of art, or even social aspects related to it that perhaps would be important for us to consider? Well, it, it's hard to answer that question in the abstract, again, because you, you kind of would have to talk about a specific work of art. It, you, you can't talk about music in general, or the qualities of music in general. You really have to look at the, the specific aspects of this or that piece of music and and think about you know what sort of impact it's had, and then you can you can start to talk about something a little bit more 
a little bit more specific. Um, I would say that so, something that is very important generally is that if if people don't understand what the motivations of the artist were in producing a particular work of art, or if they don't understand the context that it came out of, then it might be very difficult for them to to appreciate it. But one of the, one thing that you can do, and that, that I think is very important to do, is to just provide some general keys to understanding the piece. And it doesn't have to be complex or sophisticated necessarily. You can just say, look, this is what the artist was trying to do here. This is what their preoccupations were. This is the this is the context, the sort of social or political context or whatever within which they were living and working. And this is how their work relates to that. And you embed it in a larger context. And you can say, okay, it relates to this, it relates to that, it relates to this historical event, it relates to uh, this other work of art that is also very, very well known, or something like that. And then when the, the audience can start to see, okay, this is not just an isolated um, painting with a bunch of pigment stuck onto a canvas sitting on a wall, this is actually, that's not what this object is. It's not just, you know, a bunch of different colors that somebody's put on a canvas. It's actually, um, it, it comes out of a, a cultural context. It has a meaning. There is intention behind it. There is an expressive aim of some kind. And sometimes, you know, if you're not particularly close to that culture or to that context, then you actually need somebody to just give you, you know, a few indications of that, just a basic historical outline. And in my experience, when you provide that information, then the task gets much, much, much easier for the audience. And that's exactly what I try to do in my YouTube channel when I analyze pieces of music. I always try to explain that this is not just an isolated phenomenon that the composer just you know, uh, created absolutely out of nowhere, out of their, out of their mind. It, it comes out of a historical period. It comes out of a, a culture. It relates to that culture. It might be innovative. It might be ahead of its time. It might be something that nobody else had thought of doing. But nevertheless, it, it's still it comes out of a particular context. So once you start elucidating that, then you can start looking at the particularities of, of, of the art, and then you can start to sort of understand it a little bit more for what it is and, and appreciate it a little bit more. But I think for, for a lot of audience members, if, if they don't have those elements in place, if they're, if they're not sure what they're looking at or what they're hearing, they don't even know what it is, then it's very hard to enjoy it. So just give a few basic pointers on on the, the 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 history of that particular work of art on on what the artist was trying to do and then once that has sunk in then i think you can just try to enjoy the work on a more surface level where you just sort of appreciate the atmosphere that it creates or the effects that it creates and you don't have to sort of worry so much about what is it that it means what is it that they're trying to do because you've already sort of you've dealt with that Mm -hmm. Okay, so just one last question. Uh, as an artist and in the specific artistic milieu where you move, uh, would you say that perhaps, uh, a um, and taking, taking into account that type of music that you usually compose, that perhaps as an artist, uh, do, do you feel any sort of peer pressure to when you produce a piece of music for it to conform to certain criteria or to the status quo that is dominant in that type of artistic milieu or, or not? Well, I don't produce my work in a vacuum. And I mean, I'm, I'm a professional composer, which which means that people will pay me money to write a piece. And so when, when, you're, when you're doing that, then there's going to be a contract and there's going to be expectations on the order of, you know, how long is this piece going to be? What are the instruments going to be? What is the context within which the piece will be performed? And that sort of thing. So, it, so I suppose you could say that those elements constitute a certain form of external uh, arbitrary imposition upon the artist's freedom. Because the minute you've signed a contract, then that means that you have to produce this piece and not a different piece, and you have to produce it by this date, and you have to write for this particular ensemble or orchestra or, or whatever it might be. But, I mean, that has more to do, I suppose, with the, the sort of more general characteristics of the piece, and it doesn't actually touch the, the meaning of what it is that you're trying to communicate. And I think the artist has to be absolutely free to pursue whatever uh, insights or meanings or areas of aesthetic investigation they see fit. The, the most important thing is that it has to be, as far as I'm concerned, it has to be authentic. In other words, it has to stem from a, a true personal impulse of something that that artist is deeply compelled by and, and feels an, a, a sort of primordial need to investigate. That's the most important thing. I think if, if the artist is doing something and their motivation is to please an audience, 
or to sell as many tickets as possible or to do what their what they think their colleagues want them to do or what they think will make them popular then you know that that's that's a strategy that can work actually in the short term it, it and I've, I've seen it happen where you know you see artists who notice that a particular style of, of composition or whatever or painting is becoming popular and they say oh I you know maybe I'll do that too because then I can sort of uh, ride that particular wave and find a way for um, for my work to become noticed. Um, and that can work in the short term, but the problem is it's not generally a very good long-term strategy because once people move on to something else, then you're stuck pursuing a, a line of aesthetic investigation that has sort of had its 15 minutes of fame and and you've, you've spent that time doing something that is not necessarily deeply meaningful to you. So you've, you've sort of wasted your time to some, to some, to some extent, I think. So I think it's much better to remain you know, doggedly faithful to your own intuitions, your own inspiration, and see where that leads. And that doesn't mean that you lock yourself away in a room in isolation and you don't pay any attention to anything that's happening in the outside world. Um, I think ideally you should have, um, you know, you should be partly focused on your inner world and on your own intuitions, and but you should also at the same time you know, you should you should be observing the effects that that work has on the outside world as well, not necessarily in order to change it if it's not popular or if people react to it negatively. But you should think about that. I mean, there there should be some form of resonance, I think, where the the work at a certain point leaves the your your sort of mental space, it leaves the immediate sphere of 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 you as a person, and goes out externally into the world and and is interacted with with other people. And I think that a lot of the the, the meaning and the impact of a piece comes from that process of externalization and the work being out in the public sphere and having some kind of an impact. And so you have to pay attention to that as well, um, especially if you want to have ongoing opportunities as an artist. You know, you have to um, think a little bit about how you're going to present yourself, how you're going to present your work. So I wouldn't call that peer pressure exactly, but it, it but it, it's simply a recognition of the fact that we don't exist in a vacuum. I'm I'm not just an isolated individual alone in a room. I have a family. I have uh, professional contacts. I live within a society, and all of these different things have to work together co coherently in such a way that I'm able to survive. And everyone around me is you know not completely exasperated with me, and maybe I can even contribute to making their lives better and that sort of thing. So, but that's not peer pressure. That that's just simply you know, wanting things to go well. So it's a little bit different. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So let's end the conversation here. And Mr. Andreev, it was again a pleasure to have you on the channel for a third time now. Uh, and thank you a lot again for taking the time to be with us today. Thank you very much. It was a great pleasure. And thank you for the very interesting questions. Hi there, thank you for watching this interview until the end. As you might have noticed, I've started my channel last year and I've been putting out regular interviews with academics and intellectuals from a variety of fields. So to keep the channel sustainable, I would really like to ask you to please visit my Patreon page and to consider making a pledge there. Or alternatively, you can also do it on PayPal or Subscribestar. I will leave all the links in the description box. Otherwise, if you like what I'm doing, please share it, leave a like and hit the subscription button. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my patrons, Karen Litzke, Anne Blanchett, Perel Galarsen, Lau Guerrero, Chantel Gelinas, Jim Frank, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunda, Brian Rivera, Lucas Stafiniak, and my first producer, Isar Weber. Thank you for 